The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, everybody. Um, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. For uh, and thanks for joining us here um, on Zoom for this special online edition of Designing Interactive Systems Two. Um, this semester we'll be starting uh, the class this way, and uh, when the uh, Corona pandemic allows us to uh, meet again in person, then we'll um, come back to the uh, more entertaining and more interactive way of meeting in our seminar room. Um, with, as with all our classes, um, this uh, slide has the most important URL on it, um, our homepage, hci.rwth, et cetera, slash DIS2. So that's the short for this class. Anything you need to know will be on this website, on this page, or be linked from there. So um, if you only remember one URL, this is the one to keep in mind. Um, also, before we get started, uh, we will dive into um, covering what the class is about and then dive right into our first topic. Um, I want to give a, a quick recap of um, a little bit of Zoom video conferencing um, etiquette. So uh, just to make sure, um, that we have uh, an enjoyable experience for everybody. Um, the first thing I would like to ask you, I would love to have an interactive class here. So um, there's a reason why I'm not just recording this onto tape and then putting it online for you to watch, uh, but why we're actually going through the effort of making this a real time um, you know, video conference where everybody can speak up and everybody can join in if they have a question or comment. Um, so because of this, um, I would really appreciate if you could turn on your video uh, so that we can see each other. Um, the uh, point is that if we have people just lurking in the back with an audio channel, um, it's kind of like somebody who walks into the, uh, the seminar room um, fully sort of covered in black cloth or something. So um, I'd like to be able to see you guys and see your reactions, um, understand if I'm making any sense, and it may also make it easier for you guys to um, stay with us and, and join us in the interactive parts of the class. Um, the, uh, you can be uh, rest assured, you can rest assured that your video will not be in the lecture recording. Right now, just like in the real class, you are seeing everybody else that's in the class, that's as it would be in real life. Um, but what we're recording is only the slides um, and my um, headshot in, in the corner of that. So that will be the um, composition that gets uh, recorded um, on, in the uh, lecture capture. So no worries, your video will not be uh, in any recording. Secondly, um, please do ask questions if you have any. Um, again, this will not bring your video to the foreground. We've locked my video in so that uh, the one that you're seeing, the speaker that you're seeing is always me, even if you are talking. So only your voice will be in the recording. Um, and to avoid that we talk over each other when we do this, um, this is a little harder on video conferencing than in real life. Please use the uh, raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, the way to get to that, if you want to follow along right now, is um, you should find somewhere in your uh, interface, depending on which client you're running, um, something called uh, manage participants, or uh, what's it called in German? Um, Teilnehmer something, I suppose. Um, if you click on that, you should get a list of the participants. And at the very bottom of that, there should be a little um, icon, among other things, of a blue hand. Um, if you click on this, then this will mean that a little blue hand appears in the corner of your video. You can try this out right now to see the effect um, and, and raise your hand. And then that means for us, we actually see this also in the participants list and you get bumped to the top of the participants list so that um, me or Sebastian can be sure to actually catch that. Uh, and uh, we'll speak, uh, speak to you and, and ask you to uh, um, ask your question um, and that's uh, the best way to avoid us talking over each other. The other request that we have um, is um, once you're done with your question, um, you can uh, turn the raise hand off again. Um, if you forget, we may do this for you. So uh, don't be annoyed when we take this down after you ask your questions. Um, if you have another one, just put it back up again. If, you're not, if you don't have a question and you don't want to speak up, 
Um, please mute your microphone. I can see that pretty much everybody's already done that. Thank you very much. Um, that's much appreciated. Um, this is something that we need to just avoid the uh, dreaded echo effects when somebody has some background noise um, or has, has a problem with their microphone or speakers. You can make your life uh, even easier if you want. Uh, if you go into your audio settings, that's uh, usually next to the microphone, there's a little triangle. Um, and, and when you get to the audio settings through that menu, then you can turn on the option to press space to temporarily unmute. This is kind of like a walkie-talkie mode where only while you're holding down the space bar, uh, you can speak. Your microphone gets unmuted. When you let go, it gets turned off again. However, be aware that um, if the focus of Zoom is not in the foreground, then uh, your space, uh, you know, pressing space will go to some other random app that you have in the foreground and it won't work. Um, of course, I'm perfectly sure that all of you will have Zoom in the foreground at all times and listen eagerly. Um, but you know, just be aware that this is a trick that you could fall into. Um, finally, a uh, really good idea, not just for this meeting, but uh, in general for video conferencing, is to uh, turn on as many lights as you can find in your room um, as possible. So you look, um, well, let's say less like a zombie, okay? I know this is an early class, relatively. Um, and so this will really help if you put a lot of light on yourself, it will help to make the image look um, crisper and will also allow others to better see you. And for example, to, for me to see whether you're, uh, whether you look interested or boring, whether I need to go faster or slower, stuff like this. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm per personally facing a, a, a large window that has sunlight coming in, um, but um, I still have a, a lamp here to, to the right and another lamp here to the left um, that are just normal like desk lamps um, that I'm uh, using to just um, light up this area a little more. Okay, um, when you turn on your video, thank you very much for that. Uh, if you are embarrassed about the mess in your, in your uh, student dorm room, uh, that's totally fine. You can use the virtual background feature of Zoom, which is probably the one that gets most enjoyed by people of all the features. Um, and you can, um, you know, turn on the uh, Golden Gate Bridge as your background or your favorite picture that you like. Um, this works really well if you have a fairly um, evenly colored real background and then it will cut you out and sort of montage you into this uh, virtual wonderland. Um, okay, I think this is everything about um, how to set up the video conferencing. Um, the uh, Class is unusual this, uh, this semester. Uh, we're trying to make this work as an interactive um, class nevertheless. Uh, we'll need your help a little bit with this. So thanks for bearing with us. And if things don't go smooth, then um, please be, uh, be a little bit patient. Thank you. Now, um, we'll take a bio break after about 45 minutes um, so that uh, you guys can take a quick stretch and um, then we'll be back again for the second half of this. Moving on, um, this class falls into uh, four parts, I could say. Um, the first part, we'll be talking about a few key concepts of um, how user interfaces work. This class is basically um, peeling back the uh, layer um, of the user interface and looking behind to really find out um, what is going on in the user interface. How is this technically implemented? So this first part will cover things like device technologies and um, also introduce you to a reference model for Windows system architectures um, that can really help you to understand different kinds of um, existing Windows systems and how they work. Now, how do events really get from, you know, your mouse, cl you know, clicking your mouse to actually something happening on the screen or when an app wants to draw something or, or put some text on the screen? How does that actually work? How does it get to the right pixels um, on the screen? This is uh, more complex than, than one might think. It's something we don't think about a lot. Um, but uh, once you've looked into this, it's actually quite fascinating to see how Windows systems work. And this has always been one of the things that I found really intriguing about HCI, that you can make a complex system that handles events uh, work like this and be a smooth experience for the user. In part two, we will then um, kind of do what, what people um, often do when they're in, in different disciplines, look at you know, existing systems and, and quickly analyze and understand how they 
um, address the challenges of building good interactive system architectures. Um, this will be including um, standard window systems from, from X and Wayland through Smalltalk, Mac OS Windows, um, to uh, cross-platform um, window systems. Um, we'll be looking at mobile uh, uh, systems as well in, in the third part. <coughs> the, in, the, in the second part for the window systems that are mostly uh, desktop based, we're especially interested in understanding um, best practices and, and um, engineering concepts and tricks and patterns, if you like, on how to build these systems. So I don't expect any of you to become a, an expert coder in, uh, in one of these window systems that we'll be addressing, whether it's you know, an, an old one like X or Smalltalk, or whether it's a, a, it's a current one like uh, Mac OS or Windows. It's more, we're looking at each of these and trying to pull out the best ideas um, from them to understand how they work. Um, we will then also move beyond the desktop. Of course, uh, today, no lecture about interactive uh, systems will be complete without that. So uh, we'll look, take a strong look at mobile platforms, um, take a peek into how Android and iOS work. The challenges are quite different there. You've got, all of a sudden, you've got multi-touch input. You know, how do you handle that with an event model and so on? Um, and uh, you don't have you know, any, you know, any multi-window interfaces anymore, not really. Um, and, and so how does, how does that get handled? Uh, we'll then move into multimedia. So we'll talk about how um, um, audio as an input and output modality works, what's different about it from, from the visual modality and uh, what kind of special challenges and opportunities it gives you. And we'll do the same for haptics. So haptics is very unique. It's a very strange input output metaphor that you know, any, uh, any uh, output that you create and input is, is usually linked because you're touching, uh, you know, the, the interface is touching the, the user's body and it's always a two-way uh, connection. So uh, that'll be part of our, um, our topic as well. And um, once we've covered these kinds of things, we will then move into uh, something that's actually fairly new for this class. We only did this the first time um, in full format uh, last year, uh, and we will cover a bunch of actual prototyping tools. These days, when you start working in HCI and industry especially, um, you will be facing the challenge of quickly create a prototype of some sort and, and show us how it works. And we've touched a bit on this uh, in DIS1, uh, but we'll talk more about prototyping tools that let you build uh, functioning user interfaces quickly um, and easily interface, for example, with the graphics team that takes care of the visual uh, design of these, of these interfaces. Um, we'll also, uh, this will be interesting, I hope that by that time we're back in a, in a physical setting, but otherwise we'll, we'll find a way to teach this uh, online as well. Uh, we'll cover things like physical computing and um, uh, systems that, um, you know, where you prototype the hardware user interface of an experience. Um, and this we will do by actually giving you guys a chance to learn the Arduino um, IDE and play with the Arduino for a few hours and uh, build some blinking LED sketches and servo motors and stuff like this. So it's a pretty um, uh, wide cast on, on um, user interface technology. You could say when uh, GIS1 was the class that was uh, talking about all the basics of HCI, um, GIS2 is back more in the sort of comfort zone of the average computer scientist or, you know, media informatics student or something like this, um, because it's more technical. There will be a lot of coding going on, so be prepared to uh, write quite a bit of code in quite a bit of different languages and environments. Um, we want you to quickly you know, get to to get used to the fact that you just pick up a toolkit, you understand its principles, its patterns. Um, and you can go and, and write apps with it and build, uh, build applications and, and solutions with it. And since you are our, our RWTH students, we don't want to stop there. We don't just want you to become good application developers that can use existing toolkits, but we're also taking this look at the toolkits because I want you guys to be able to write the next great toolkit. You know, when the next challenge comes around, uh, when we finally have cheap, affordable, ubiquitously available, let's say, I don't know, wearable clothing display and touch input, input um, those kinds of systems will need some sort of uh, window system, if you want to call it that, some kind of event handling system too, some kind of interactive layer on top of the base operating system 
And um, you know, this might be the challenge you face when you when you join a, a company or when you work in, in research. So you guys are not just gonna be app developers understanding how these existing toolkits work, but our goal is to also make you, enable you to write, um, you know, to write the next toolkit yourself and become toolkit um, developers and Windows system developers yourself. Okay, um, just very quickly, uh, a few administrative uh, details here. Um, first of all, um, the class is a, is a three lecture, um, two lab uh, session class. Um, it gives you six ECTS credits. Um, but as usual, um, expect to spend more like, you know, nine time hours, um, nine full hours per week on uh, this class, because there will be assignments, uh, there will be things that you'll be working on with a, with a buddy, in this case, um, using online collaboration tools um, that, that you can choose freely. Um, and so there's quite a bit of time that you will spend outside class to work on the materials in this, in this uh, lecture. Um, the class times are today, we've got our lecture, uh, 9.30 to 12. I'm sorry about the slightly unusual format, um, but um, this used to be a, a four hour lecture class and we compressed down the material to uh, focus on the most important things and to make it a little more bearable um, to sort of uh, three lecture hours, but this doesn't fit nicely into RWH's uh, standard schedule model. So that's a conflict we can't really resolve really well, but I'm assuming that you guys are not eager on starting at 8.30 instead. Um, so uh, the lab is on Mondays, uh, 2.30 to 4, so standard schedule. Um, not in room 222 at this point, but everything happening on Zoom um, until further notice when um, you know, Corona lets us um, meet in person again. Who's in the team here today? Uh, and for the semester, that would be uh, myself and Sebastian, who's also here on, on video. Hi, Sebastian. Um, he is actually um, a, a research assistant in my lab, a PhD student, um, an excellent iOS coder. If you ever have a really tricky question about iOS development and, I don't know, you buy him a sheep, Sebastian, or something, then they can ask you a question. <laughs> no, please, no more sheep souvenirs. My office is already full of that, so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, uh, the, uh, he's also the teaching assistant for this class. And um, if you do have any questions about the class, whether it's um, you, know, you, you missed some content, you have a question about the content, you've got a problem with signing up, you've got a problem with an assignment or enrollment or anything, um, please uh, send an email to uh, Sebastian. Um, if you use DIS2 in the subject line, it will help them find your email quickly in, in everything that comes in. Um, I would recommend not emailing me uh, because I get a host of email and me or email may get lost in the, in the flood. And I probably won't be able to return to you more quickly than uh, Sebastian can. He's probably gonna be the fastest way to get an answer. Um, of course, if there's anything that you feel you can't resolve, then um, uh, you know, between you guys, uh, then feel free to contact me uh, as well. All right, um, the great. Uh, this should probably also be, um, something that people who are in the class here are familiar with. Um, we have a split of uh, how your grade gets uh, compiled. So you'll be doing weekly assignments, um, turn them in, and those will actually make up the biggest part of your grade, 40%. Um, uh, another 25% will be part of your grade as the midterm exam, uh, which is happening on June 9th. So mark your calendars now to make sure you're not on vacation or gone or have something else uh, you know that is pressing at that time because you would be missing um, a quarter of your grade that you could achieve. And then um, the final exam is on July 22nd uh, and that'll be uh, accounting for 35% of your grade. The uh, repeat exam in case you uh, fail or miss the first one then it would be on August 15th. Um, now um, why we're doing it, this, uh, you should already be familiar with because you've probably taken another class from us before, um, but just in case you aren't, um, we're trying to you know, get you guys to continuously engage with the material over the course of the semester, not just push everything off to you know, the three days before the final exam and then cram everything into your head. Um, and in order to award you and reward you for this uh, wonderful behavior of continuous learning, which is much better for actually learning stuff than cramming everything, 
um, we give you points for that. So that's our way of trying to encourage you to actually stay with us throughout the semester. The other thing is that, of course, this also means that by the time everything else gets into crunch mode, um, you can actually be pretty relaxed about um, you know, DIS2 because you've already secured 65% um, of your grade on the day that you walk into the final exam. We're, this is also why we're starting so early this semester um, in the first regular semester week, rather than pushing things off to when we possibly can meet in person again. Um, I want to get you guys working on DIS2 and give you a chance to use your time now so that when everything else starts up later this semester, which will probably be in a little bit of a crunch mode because people somehow need to get through the material in less time, um, we will be able not to put additional pressure on you um, but actually have the material spread out. So this is another reason why it's really useful and helpful to stay on top of the material now these next um, two weeks uh, while you still have a maybe slightly lighter course load than normal. Okay. Um, this may be a good time to uh, maybe do a, a quick poll. I would love to understand where everybody is coming from in terms of their uh, study program. So we typically have people from the bachelor's and master's programs in computer science. Uh, we have people from technical communication. Uh, we have people from computational engineering uh, science. We got media informatics masters. We got software systems engineering masters. Um, we may have people from, I don't know, electrical engineering maybe. Um, that could uh, be true as well. We at least saw some of those yesterday in current topics in HCI. So please, uh, you should be seeing a poll on your screen right now. Um, and uh, please give us a quick answer uh, what your major is, what your field of study is, so that I get an understanding of the distribution of students here. Uh, we currently have 34 people in the call here, 35. Ah, another one joined us, hello. Um, so let's see until we get um, a significant amount of people to vote on this. I'll give you guys just a minute to, to do that poll. All right, we're almost at the 75% mark, cool. Um, as expected, most of you guys are from uh, CS Masters. That's uh, sort of the, the, the most frequent program that uh, takes this class. Uh, we, got a, we got somebody from the bachelors, which is perfectly fine. You'll take, be able to take this class as advanced, uh, extra in, either for extra credit in your bachelors or take it um, already as a master's class, even though you haven't finished your bachelors. Um, technical communication, both bachelors and masters also often um, take this class. Um, and um, of course, some media informatics students who probably by this time have moved over here to, to Aachen. Now, uh, and especially for those folks, um, this might actually be an easier setup this time because you don't need to physically travel here, but can join in from wherever you live. Um, I see SSE and um, somebody else. I'm assuming that other, there's one person who said other there. Um, uh, whoever that is, maybe you can speak up and tell us what, uh, what my, uh, program you're in. That will mean that you need to unmute your mic because we currently don't know who you are. It's in the chat. It says data science. Data science. Okay. Hi. Yeah, right. We've got data right. science now. Data science. <laughs> Hi, Johannes. Thanks for joining us. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll leave the poll open in case anybody else wants to uh, pitch in and hasn't seen it yet. Um, so for now, let's just uh, continue with uh, our material here. Uh, assignments. So. The weekly assignments are supposed to be there to give you continuous chances to practice what we what we teach uh, and what you learn and uh, to give you hopefully uh, swift feedback on what you did. Um, this also means that you need to turn these in um, by the day they're announced because right after that we will discuss them and after that it's kind of pointless um, to have them to have them discussed. Um, the uh, that's why we need to grade late submissions with a 5.0. So please turn these in on time. Um, we make a team size of two students. Um, 
we, if we have an even number of students, this should work out for everybody. Uh, I don't want to see any um, you know, armies of one, please. Um, if we do have an uneven number, we may form one team of uh, three, but um, in this case, uh, Sebastian uh, will let you know explicitly in writing that you can do this. Um, so don't turn in solutions without a team partner. Um, we won't grade those and they'll be an immediate fail for this uh, assignment. Uh, simply because we don't have the capacity to grade, um, you know, 50 uh, students worth of um, you know, technical submissions. Also, this may be obvious, but um, we can't be your debuggers. So please submit code that compiles. Um, and if it doesn't, we won't be able to, uh, to grade it and it will be a fail for that exam. So ma please make sure that it does compile. Um, we will be going through quite a bunch of different platforms. And for some of these, uh, we have solutions of uh, virtualization, for example, Smalltalk, um, or, um, or of course, Java and those kinds of things you can, you can run on any platform. Um, but some uh, assignments will also require you to use a Mac. Um, now, you may not have a Mac. Uh, that's terrible news, but uh, do not despair. We can help you. Um, we actually do have a, a, a pool room. Um, Sebastian, do we know whether the pool rooms are currently accessible or are they currently closed and we're hoping they open back up while the time we get to that? Um, currently they are closed because they also uh, belong to the category of uh, basically learning rooms. Yeah. Uh, we will see how the situation develops. Um, we are basically talking about uh, two of eight assignment sheets. Um, that are happening at the end of the course. Um, if the situation doesn't change until then, we will have to uh, change um, either the grading scheme of that or um, provide some alternative, but uh, we will figure it out until okay. then. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, this is all kind of figuring it out as we go because the situation is so volatile and changing all the time, so um, bear with us. Uh, you submit your assignments via Moodle, uh, which should not be uh, a big surprise for you. Okay, just as a reminder, everything you need to know to take part in this course um, is available from our jump page, hci.rvh-aachen.de slash bis2. So please make a bookmark of that and uh, check back for that. You'll find the whole schedule of the class on there in a wonderfully dynamically expanding view that Sebastian himself designed. Um, there's the class information, there are links to the uh, RWH online um, Moodle and, and lecture videos. So everything you need is on there and you'll also find announcements there um, if we have something that we need to guys to know. Plus this is a page that you can get to without being logged into any system. So it's also publicly available, uh, which makes it easier to pass it on to others. All right, now um, I just wanna briefly talk about how um, DIS1 and DIS2 sort of uh, fit together. Um, we have already talked, uh, uh, you know, last semester, you've seen that um, DIS1 tends to cover sort of this uh, right hand, uh, this left hand side, sorry, um, of what uh, this, this uh, view of human computer interaction as a field includes. So we talked about human information processing, language communication, interaction, we, and we, uh, this was all sort of about the human, right? DS1 was a lot about, you know, how people behave and how they work, if you want, uh, to understand better how they use computers and why they do certain things certain ways. Um, DS1 also included um, design approaches and uh, example systems. We looked at a bunch of example systems and case studies, um, you know, from put that there to the knowledge navigator and Starfire and all those systems. Um, as examples of systems that illustrate uh, certain challenges and certain um, progress in human computer interaction as a field. You saw a lot about prototyping, uh, so design approaches in uh, DIS1, so various uh, techniques for that. Um, and we visited evaluation techniques at length. So you've heard a lot about how you run user studies, how you do uh, control studies, how you interview people, how you write a questionnaire. Um, Etc. Etc. 
we also had a bit of discussion on uh, formal methods of writing down how you actually want a certain dialogue to run, right? So notation systems were also part of DIS-1. If you didn't take DIS-1, um, maybe we can make this our second call. Um, uh, so, uh, Sebastian, if you can capture the first one and just uh, capture the results from that, maybe you can run a second one and just ask people uh, whether they have taken DIS-1, uh, yes or no. Uh, and I'd like to understand what the, what the ratio is here of the people who are in the room today. While you're setting that up, I just want to talk about this briefly. Um, we do not make DIS-1 a formal requirement for, for uh, DIS-2. Uh, simply because we want to maximize your flexibility of taking classes in the order and, and, and sequence and, and so on that, that you want. I know it's always, um, you know, unnerving and, and annoying if you cannot take a class because you missed something else the semester before. Um, on the other hand, DIS-1 is probably the most important and fundamental class that we teach um, that we assume you know your uh, um, um, you, you know the basics of so we don't kick you out um, <laughs> like the maybe uh, option there um, so uh, if you did take the S one you're fine um, if you did not uh, you can still stick with us that's fine excuse me um, uh, but the uh, we may expect you here and there to just know things about DIS-1. So um, most often you will recognize when these come up because suddenly we'll be talking about something and you're like, huh, never heard about this. Uh, so be prepared if you haven't taken DIS-1 to maybe go back. Uh, we've got some nicely chopped up video material on each topic in like short 10 minute break uh, slices. Um, and uh, Practice that material for yourself. Learn these things and catch up on these yourself. Uh, we won't be repeating DIS-1 content here in depth, uh, but rather refer to it to refresh your memory um, and build on those results. So that's my deal. Uh, I don't want to kick you out because I want you to be able to flexibly study the way that you want, but it may require you to do some extra work if, if you're missing some of the basics from that class. Okay, looks like most people, about like, you know, 90% have taken DIS-1. If you haven't, uh, the videos are on YouTube. Um, go to the slash DIS-1 uh, jump page and you should be able to find everything there. Um, there is one lecture that we cannot put publicly online because we're using a lot of copyrighted material. So it's just behind um, closed doors, if you like. Uh, talk to Sebastian if you need access to that particular uh, class. It's, on, it's the one on visual design. Um, which is also new for last year, so you won't be finding any other older recordings of that either. So DIS-2, what are we doing here this semester? Um, we are looking at the right-hand side, if you want, uh, of this uh, graph. And, and this didn't, you know, this was not intended, but it's some actually sort of turned out that way, uh, that this graphic actually represents what HCI is about pretty well. Um, because now we will be talking about input-output devices, we'll be talking about dialogue techniques and different genres of interaction, you know, from uh, uh, voice interfaces to um, point-and-click interfaces to multi-touch UIs and so on. And we'll be talking about the architecture of these systems. And um, D2, the area down there, the implementation techniques and tools will be what we cover in our technical analysis of how these existing systems work, how the software patterns look behind them, and in our analysis of prototyping tools that we'll be doing towards the end of this class. So um, all in all, this gives you a pretty good coverage of, of HCI as a field. You can see three things are missing. Computer graphics, uh, because honestly, Life Cobalt knows this much better than I do. So take his class if you really want to know a lot about computer graphics in depth. Uh, we will be using some basics of computer graphics um, and introduce those that, uh, that we need for this class. But apart from that, we are considering the ability to uh, put images and lines and stuff like this on screen um, just as a, as a given for our architecture. So you won't be writing a Bezlem algorithm here. Um, ergonomics is also something we don't look at a lot. There are folks in psychology who know about this stuff better than we do. 
Um, and it's a field that really touches more into psychology than, than into the computer science um, area. Uh, that said, you will uh, always find that we, um, you know, when you evaluate a system, you will probably have somebody um, also give you feedback about how ergonomic the system was, how well it uh, felt in, in physically operating it, or whether it was a strain on the eyes or the hands or on, on their memory, or et cetera. And finally, the uh, area on top there, use and context, um, is something that uh, is best covered in classes like uh, Computer Supported Collaborative Work, CSCW. Um, for example, Wolfgang Prinz from Fraunhofer FIT, who also is a, um, an associate professor at RWTH, um, covers these areas quite well. And I encourage you to check out these other things that will round out your, um, your education in becoming a, a, a kick-ass HCI engineer and researcher really well. The one thing that we will be uh, referring to um, now and again from DIS1 uh, will be the, the DIA cycle, um, also often called like the rapid prototyping um, process or uh, the task artifact cycle, whatever you might hear. Um, the key idea behind this, just as a refresher here, is that um, when you build an interactive product, you don't do the waterfall model of first you know, writing down your specifications and then implementing what you wrote down and then throwing the result at your users, but rather you will start with a very early sketch, sometimes even just a story, remember the storyboard prototypes, for example, of how your system is supposed to work and help the user. Then you'll take these storyboards uh, or these early prototypes and take them to the user. Um, you know, implementation in this case is just writing it down. Um, and in the analysis phase, you will be taking them to the user, get, to, get their feedback on whether you are on the right track. And with that feedback, you will then go back to your um, design board and include their feedback and advance your prototype to the next level. The next one might actually maybe be a paper sketch of the rough layout of the UI and the rough functionality that you expect to, to provide. And then, you know, sketching that out and drawing it, um, making it into a paper prototype, for example, maybe a post-it prototype, remember that from DS1, will be your next level of, of fidelity, slightly better than just having a couple of words on a, on a page. And you, again, take these two users, uh, evaluate it with them, get their feedback, and go back to the design board. And then maybe the next thing you build is a, a, a very simple software mock-up. This may be done using a graphics package where you use no coding at all, you just fake the UI on a bunch of PowerPoint slides or uh, in, you know, uh, in Adobe Photoshop or in any of the tools that we will be talking about um, later in this class, like Balsamic or Adobe um, XD, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with these, you go, you know, you build these prototypes and you again go back to your users and make sure that you're still on the right track. And, as you advance with this, your prototype gets more high fidelity and you add more and more functionality to it. Uh, you actually start coding uh, more and more functions that work for real, but you continue having an involvement with your user base throughout the process and you continue to have an involvement uh, and an influ influence of the design uh, expertise in your team. Um, hopefully all the big bugs that way get ironed out um, uh, towards the beginning and in the final um, implementations of your prototype, you only fix small bugs um, because building working code and then discovering that it make it that it completes the full completely wrong need um, is a major loss. So you don't want to end up with that. So look back into the DIA cycle in DIS1 if you weren't there for the uh, currently I think 13 percent that didn't take DIS1 and the three percent that one person that isn't sure. Um, all right, uh, we're got now going to jump into sort of the, uh, a, a very quick overview of, um, the history of UI par programming paradigms. This may sound a bit like what we did in DIS1, where we went through the history of HCI, but we're redoing this visit now with, um, our geek hat on. So now we're going to be looking at this material. Uh, and uh, trying to understand how the technology behind these systems evolved. Uh, and here I'm, uh, I'm using a nice uh, analogy um, that um, Jacob Nielsen uh, published in, in his book on uh, 
uh, user um, engineering, I think it's called, um, usability engineering, there you go, um, that uh, sort of relates to these things as sort of 0D, 1D, and, and, and 2D interfaces. So what we started out with in computing uh, was what you could call batch processing. And this is still a term that we often see today in, in computing literature. And it's a concept that still sometimes applies when you need to run a bunch of uh, jobs and you don't want any interaction in between, you just want to run them, um, you do batch processing. Um, back in the days, you would prepare data on punch cards, uh, little paper cards that were about the size you know, of a postcard, a little thinner and, and, and slimmer. Um, and those punch cards would basically encode your, um, your code and data um, using these, uh, uh, these punched holes in the cards and then you would bring these to the operator's desk, you know, put down your stack of punch cards and the op tell the operator to please run those. And they would then feed them into the big scary machine in the back of the room. And the next day you might come back um, and get a printout, um, get a printout online basically that then tells you uh, whether your job ran successfully or not. Uh, and whether you actually, you know, what the results were, if it worked. So, the program running there had no interactive capabilities, right? There was no uh, interaction between you and the computer, except for that one point where you basically um, handed your code, if you want, and your data to the computer. All user input, all the jobs and parameter parameters are specified in advance. Um, all the in output of the system, it may happen over time, it may output things a line at a time, but really you're looking at it at the end of the program output, right? When the printout is there. Um, what this meant for the software behind it is that um, these applications were written uh, and you often actually find these references still today, uh, considering user interface input, just another kind of um, file I.O. Um, does anybody know a current operating system uh, where you can still see this connection that user input is basically like file input output a concept from a from a modern operating system where that still sort of shines through feel free to just speak up if you have an idea So a modern operating system, and, and as you use it, um, there's one way of interacting with it that actually um, you can still see that the input from the user and the output that goes to the user could just as equally uh, come from a file or go into a file. Come on here, you guys are computer scientists. I know you're using this. A command line? The command line, yeah. The command line especially uh, thanks, this, I think this is Attila. Um, uh, the command line, especially in, in Linux, shows this really nicely, right? Um, when you can actually, you know, put your parameters into a command line, but you can, and the input in there, but you can also send the output of a command into a file rather than to the screen, right? Um, or even read user input from a file um, and those kinds of things. So that's a typical remnant um, of the um, of the batch processing age, which was when Linux was was first conceived, and those wonderful TTY um, connections that you still get in um, modern um, Linux when you when you look at your consoles, uh, that's short for teletype, right? That's a that's an example of a, a slightly more modern um, example of interacting with these things, but that's still very much in the in the batch processing mode. Um, you know, job control languages were uh, were a child of those times. Um, JCL uh, from the IBM 3090 systems, for example, is a famous, uh, very widely used example back back in those days. Um, but you know, those are so old that when I was a very young student, I still occasionally you know saw these in the computing center when I wanted to print out my LaTeX um, you know thesis report or something, um, and then I would run write a JCL job file that was. And back then it was already weird. So yeah, we're not seeing this anymore very much and that's good. Um, the idea here is uh, you prepare your data ahead of time 
the program gets executed um, and then it compiles basically a report throughout its running um, that is then your single uh, point of contact again with what the program did at the end. Time sharing systems, if we now move on, um, were a little more um, modern. Um, they started out sort of in the um, 60s, 70s, um, and allowed you to actually have a command line based interaction. Uh, and this is still sort of, this is very similar to you typing on, on Unix, for example. Uh, so here, you were no longer preparing your complete job in a, in a, um, in a punch card ahead of time but you could actually sort of issue one command, run it on the ter on a simple terminal. It was usually connected using just a serial connection. Um, and um, the application would read the arguments from the command line, return the results on that same terminal, and then you could run your next command. But still, um, you can tell when you run Unix commands today, Linux commands today, or even on, on your DOS shell, if you open that up, um, your command prompt, uh, you basically, while the program is running, you don't really have any influence. It's just so quick when you type DIR on, on a Windows machine, you get the directory listing. But still, that's a program that gets called. It co executes completely. It finishes, creates its output, and that's it. You cannot interact with it while it's running. It's just very short, which kind of gives you a feeling of being in an interaction because you run lots of these commands one after the other. Um, so you could say there you have what Nielsen calls sort of a one-dimensional connection. Um, uh, where you basically have a string of data, a string of commands, a string of characters flowing between the user and the system one way and then back the other. Um, we don't need to move to graphical user interfaces, interestingly, um, in order to see um, a better real-time interaction. In fact, when you start um, any full screen, if you want to call it that, um, or a terminal textual editor, like uh, VI or Vim or Emacs or Nano on your favorite you know, Linux console, um, then you can already see um, full, text, uh, full screen textual user interfaces. There's a big difference here in how you write these because all of a sudden, um, you can no longer ignore the user input while you're running. You need to actually pay attention to that, right? So your, how these programs would typically work is uh, being here exemplified by this little graphic. Um, you could imagine that um, when the user, uh, when the program gets to a certain point, it waits for a character input. And that character might just be uh, another character to your typing that the system then needs to put on the screen. And it does that. Uh, creates some screen output and then goes back, reads your next character. And if your character is some kind of command sequence or if the system is in a particular mode to, um, to expect a, a command, then it will interpret that. And again, it will just execute the command, do it, and then come back. So now you're basically, uh, if you want, you're typing tiny little commands that are only one character each, and the same program is running all the time and continues to read these characters and process them. Um, this is why the interaction starts to feel real time in this case, um, because the application receives your character input and immediately reacts to it in, um, in its main loop. But uh, so for example, here, um, if you guys um, know VI or Vim, um, okay, I want, I want another poll. I want to know this. Uh, I want to understand how many of you guys have ever used a command line editor like Nano, VI, Vim, or Emacs. I'm not going to start the poll on uh, whether Emacs or VI is better. I think we're beyond that, but I just want to understand whether you guys have ever touched a uh, textual full screen um, editor like that. So run a quick poll and see what comes out of this. Meanwhile, I'll just continue explaining this. Um, for example, if you used VI or Vim, then um, you know that this program actually had to be in a particular mode to expect to accept your characters as input uh, in your text file. If you were not in that mode, then you your character uh, keys, like if you hit W, it wouldn't create a W on your screen, but it would instead actually write the file, uh, write your 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 text to to a file. Um, so that's that's quite different from um, from what you would expect. Um, 
So uh, that's why oftentimes uh, you would see you know, the sequence WQ um, a lot in VI editors, uh, in text files that were edited VI with VI because people typed that in and forgot that they were still in insert mode and those characters just ended up in their text rather than be in commands to write the text to a file and quit the application. Yes, we've got 80% of people having used a textual full screen editor. Yeah, nice. Okay. Uh, the 20% of you who haven't, um, take a look. It's, it's like a you know, look back in time. So exciting. Um, so if, for example, you're using this tool um, and you are in command mode um, and not in insert mode in VI, then you know, um, the queue that you hit may actually mean for the program to exit and to quit. And that's what we're indicated here with this with this little x. Um, now, there's a problem with this. Can anybody see what the big problem with this application design is, with this main loop that you know, takes a character as input? Um, oh, by the way, can you see my mouse wiggling around here or not? Sebastian, can you see that? No? OK. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, and then I'm not really indicating, never mind, not a big deal. Uh, so when, when the, um, when the uh, program gets your input and then processes it and then it uh, takes your next input, can anybody th think of a problem that you might have with this design? Feel free to maybe like, you know, let's use the raise hand thing and then we can see if anybody has an idea. Take a look at the participants list. Yeah, Kai, go ahead. Uh, unmute yourself and then let us know what you think. Um, we aren't sure in which mode we are, so. Yes, so, so that is one of the problems. So these systems were often highly modal, especially VI is known for its like freakish modality, um, which meant that if you were in the wrong mode, then your character input would mean something completely different. We talked about modes quite a lot in DIS1. So for you guys who didn't attend DIS1, um, maybe read up on that. Uh, but uh, that is one of the big challenges. The only way you can address that is by trying to indicate to the user which mode they're in. And textual interfaces had a hard time doing that. Um, if you look at the slide, you can see at the way bottom there, it says insert, which is VI's way of telling you you are currently in insert mode. So what you're typing now is going into your text file and you will see your characters appear. But you know, this is not really where you are looking when you are typing, so it's easy to overlook that little indicator. Um, this is, however, not the biggest challenge that you actually have with these kinds of application designs. Uh, there is another problem with them. Maybe somebody else? Um, Attila, yeah, go ahead, unmute yourself. We have to remember the shortcuts, the keys. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Very good. So, so there's, there's also the challenge that um, these are still systems of the type remember and type rather than uh, be shown and select. So this is a classic difference between textual interfaces um, that usually require you to type in a command that you have to have in your head um, and graphical interfaces where you can basically see a menu bar with you know, a couple, couple different um, options and you pick from them and you don't need to remember all these cryptic commands and the parameters and, and, and options. Um, that's another challenge that these systems had. You guys are still thinking too much like DIS1 students though. I want you to think a little more um, of what the software design of this uh, um, application, the simple main loop, what kind of problem could it create for the user feedback? Think about, I don't know, maybe saving a large file to disk. You know, I issue a command to save my, my text and now the system goes ahead and saves it. Where the system is uh, then for the user uh, not responding because- Yeah, the system is not responding. Now I don't know who was, uh, this was Yannick probably, I suppose, yes. right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's correct. Um, the system will be unresponsive in this big blue block there on the right hand side, right? So while it's doing whatever the user asked it to do, it may have been a command that takes quite some time, maybe saving your file on a disk, um, maybe in the cloud, you know, over a slow network connection, whatever. Um, you're in the middle between Cologne and Athens and have no network reception, you know, those kinds of things. Um, 
that can take a long time. And while you're doing this, nothing is happening. So the UI and the app appears frozen to the user. That's the big problem with these designs. Um, and that's why we, uh, when we look at the next way of doing this, um, menu-based systems, we actually see a better way of addressing this. Um, and menu-based systems actually show you, um, um, this is an example, still text-based, but this is now um, the GNU Nano Editor. Um, and as you can see, not only do you have your full screen text there, but you also have um, options at the bottom. So it's addressing a couple of these things. First of all, you may still get confused um, with your mode, but you can see that actually the nano editor, other than VI, actually used control plus some key. So for example, control X to exit, which means we are replacing the modality of VI with uh, something we call quasi mode in DIS1, right? Uh, we're replacing it with something where while I hold down the control key, I switch to a different mode. It's, if you want, it's the command mode. And then if I hit X while holding down control, it means something else. But nobody's going to forget that they're holding down X, but we're not that stupid. So this is a much better design because it lets me type. And when I press X, it always means the same. If I press control X, that's a command that I issue to the computer. So it addresses that issue that um, you guys brought up of um, being, uh, being modal and forgetting which mode we're in. It also addresses the challenge that you brought up of having to remember every command. Now I have sort of almost like a menu bar at the bottom there that shows me the most important commands. That's nice, right? I don't need to remember control X is exit. I can just look at it. Um, I still need to press the key. I can't click on it or anything. There's no mouse yet in these systems, but um, you know, it's a little bit more helpful. Um, but the key issue is still not going away, right? The key issue is still there that uh, when this system was written in the way that you saw on the last slide by saying, get the command, process it, you would still have a hang up while the system is saving. Now it could maybe indicate that a little better and show you like saving dot, dot, dot or something, uh, but it would still be blocked and you would not be able to do anything, especially you would not be able to cancel the save process because there's no way to receive input. It's busy in its save routine. That's why it became important, which uh, we indicated here with this little green box, to start using threading. Um, so you need to get your time-consuming actions uh, into a separate thread or process, run them there, and get back to your command line tight inner loop, the main loop that processes user input as quickly as possible. So when you do this, then you can actually have, you know, the green process could start saving away. Meanwhile, you continue receiving input. Um, and for example, if the user then says, oh, stop the saving uh, with another special command um, that may only be available in this mode, um, then you could tell that to the green process that's running and it could stop the saving. But the user could do other things. They could maybe resize their window while the saving is happening, stuff like this, right? Um, so this is an important uh, concept that got introduced um, around the time menu-based systems came, came up. Um, and of course, uh, what we're looking for in the, in the in, if you want the, the, the real deal, are, are the menu-based systems, um, which then uh, kind of look like this. They replace the textual menu-based system with a graphical user interface. Um, and what we're seeing here on the right-hand side is a, a picture that, at least on my screen, has a wonderful moiré effect. Um, of uh, the a pretty early Mac OS uh, desktop. Um, the key difference, of course, in the graphic user interface um, is that you are moving from a character generator that just can put text uh, on the screen in, in you know, 80 by 24 um, columns or something to a bitmap display. This was pioneered, as you know, from DS1 by the the Alto and the Star, and then you know, Apple with the first with the Lisa, and then successfully with the Mac. Uh, made it a made it a common staple in in uh, business computing and and home computing, um, and the window and the Windows operating system um, brought it uh, really to the masses. This is probably the single most dramatic shift for application development. You really have to rethink 
the way that you write applications when you come from a you know command line culture and you have to write a GUI problem. This is why Apple sent out you know um, evangelists trying to explain this new programming paradigm to to developers out there, because it means that now the user is really in control. Um, the application now only reacts to user events or system events, like maybe, you know, um, I don't know, the printer is finished printing or, or a drive comes online or something like this, um, or a disk is full, you know, something like that. Um, so the user is really controlling what's going on. The application answers these re requests that the user puts out, and this requires you to, con to introduce probably the most prominent feature that we'll talk about this whole semester, uh, which is the event architecture. What you do in these cases is that um, your application starts by setting up a graphical user interface with menus and, you know, some windows and whatever. And then uh, it basically hands control to a very tight loop that looks for events. And then the underlying system, this is why you need a window system beneath that, which we'll talk about the next couple of weeks, um, will deliver events like the user clicked somewhere or they typed something or they moved the mouse or whatever it might be, or the system recognizes some input from the network or from, from, a, from a disk or something. Um, all these things get piped as events into the right application, which application is also not easy to answer, but that's what the Windows system will do that we'll talk about. Um, and when your application gets an event, it reacts to that event. Uh, it reacts to that event in what we call a callback routine. Um, and boy, this really hurt for old school developers because it used to be that as a developer, you knew exactly what's going on, right? You knew, okay, I am, uh, I'm giving control. I'm, I'm running this routine. I'm letting the user input some character, but then I'm back in control. I can do exactly what I want. I know exactly where my activity in my program is at any moment. And that's no longer true when you move to uh, graphical user interfaces and the event-based architecture. Um, at this moment, you actually need to relinquish this control and deal with the fact that after you've set up your user interface, you basically give control to the system, to this event loop, to the user. The user will trigger events, all sorts, maybe between different applications, and you can only react to these events um, in your callbacks. And those callbacks have to be written in a way that they are quick. And if they don't process very quickly, uh, like you know, putting a character on the screen or something, they have to be written so that they can run in the background thread so that control from the callback comes back directly to the event loop so that it can continue processing events. If you don't do that, you get the famous you know, uh, jerky user interface when, when an application uh, wasn't written right and was spending too much time processing something and wasn't able to run the uh, UI smoothly. And of course, this hurts much more if you have a mouse pointer that you're moving around uh, because you can see immediately if there's even the slightest lag or, or delay or latency in there. Um, initially, uh, and we'll see some examples of that, people wrote this, uh, this event handling in explicitly in every application. So every application had its own little code loop that would get an event, look at it, and determine what to do with it. Later, this was actually relinquished in an object-oriented fashion um, to the various user interface components themselves. So you didn't even have to write that loop anymore. You just called a function from the operating systems uh, library that would do all the processing, would throw the event to the right uh, um, user interface component, let's say, to you know, a button gets pushed and the button would know what to do when it gets pushed, would call the right callback. Um, and it's a wonderful object-oriented uh, distributed control kind of thing. Uh, that is the only way to make these systems work at high performance. Okay, so we will take a five minute um, bio break now. Um, and uh, so get up, stretch your legs, let some air into your uh, room wherever you are. And I will see you again in five minutes where we will then uh, continue with um, input devices. Okay, and we're back. Um, so 
Uh, by the way, this class, like uh, our other classes, is getting uh, divided into small, what we call chapters, um, which we hope will help you navigate the, uh, the video content a little more easily uh, later on. So uh, this is why this is called chapter two. Uh, and this is about the design space of input devices. This, pro, this, this concept um, is actually pretty old. Um, Card, uh, Robert, uh, Stu, Stuart Card and, and uh, um, Jock McInlay and, and, and uh, Robertson came up with this concept in the early 90s. Um, and they came up with this concept because they asked themselves a simple question. Um, back in those days, there was a proliferation of lots of different input devices. So up till then, everybody had just used a keyboard uh, and then the mouse had come around and you know, the, the 80s had become really popular. And um, suddenly people were building all sorts of input devices, you know, um, new sensors were available, touch uh, based input devices became uh, a thing in at least in research labs. Um, and <coughs> the community was wondering just what is the best input device for which task and are there things that are faster or more efficient uh, than what we're using today, like the keyboard and mouse. And um, since there were so many research papers proposing new input devices, um, several people tried to structure these input device uh, proposals into something that you could make sense of. Um, because they wanted to see whether they would find an easy way to compare proposed designs, um, maybe also even be able to anticipate if a new design was so similar to an existing one in its characteristics in, in this um, design space that they wanted to create, that you could predict what it would do. Or maybe there were certain areas that were not being explored and they wanted to identify those sort of, you know, uh, blank spots on the map. They thought about what they could use to, uh, to classify these input devices. And um, there are different ways you could do that. You could look at price, for example, or you could look at um, what modality am I using, you know, visual or auditory or haptic or whatever. But back then, most of the devices that were being proposed were physical devices um, that you would in some way, you know, manipulate with your, with your hands and fingers. And so they decided to categorize these input devices according to their physical and mechanical spatial properties. This will be uh, very appealing to, uh, to those of you who enjoy hardware because this was a very uh, hardware physically oriented um, design space. Um, this paper, by the way, is a reading assignment in, uh, and it's available already in Moodle uh, and would like you to read this paper um, so that you can um, follow along after the, after the class. You can actually grab it now if you'd like um, because that will make it easier for you to do the um, in-class exercise that we have in a few minutes. The design space of input devices is what's called a morphological approach. So this means that it took a uh, device design and said each device design in the end is considered a point in a, in a multidimensional space, a space of many, many dimensions. Um, and these dimensions are, are these different parameters that I can, um, I can identify in this device design. And um, to get to a device design, they said you could combine primitives of devices. Uh, for example, a push button is a primitive and you can put, you know, three push buttons on a mouse and you've combined them into something that then is part of the mouse, but the mouse also has other controllers like, you know, the XY uh, controller in it. Um, and these ways in which they were composed and, and, wait, and the way that these primitives worked um, were the basic uh, uh, of building this design space. Design space is a word you should hold on to because this will come up again and again. It's, it's a super powerful concept that you can apply to all sorts of different uh, problems. When you write your thesis later, um, you may have to structure related work, existing approaches to a certain technology and a design space uh, classification is very, very useful to do. So look at it that way as well. Uh, it could be a method uh, that you could also apply to um, different problems that you are facing in, in the course of your studies. So the authors said that the mechanical input devices that they could see at the time uh, could be described as a tuple. 
um, containing six components. Um, the first component uh, would be the manipulation operator, M. Uh, this is basically telling you uh, what kind of physical manipulation I have to do to a device. For example, a button needs to be pushed straight down, uh, which you could consider uh, a movement in, in the Z direction away from the, from the user if we make that assumption for the, for the coordinate system. Um, but there are also devices that I twist around an axis, like a, like a potentiometer that I twiddle. Um, or back then, a lot of force-based input devices were also being explored. So without physically displacing something, I could actually just exert force, like you can when you use you know, force touch on an iPhone, for example, today. Um, and that is, again, a different input modality. So that's the manipulation operator. Um, next came, after the manipulation operator, came the input domain. Um, the input domain is basically what kind of physical movement in the physical world is the device receiving. For example, um, if I um, twist a knob uh, around its axis, it's receiving this rotationary angle in real world of my fingers um, as the input. So the domain could be anything between, let's say, you know, zero and, and uh, I don't know, 180 degrees, for example, for a half turn, that's possible for the user to do. You then have uh, the device state. The state of the device uh, could be anything that the device itself that represents what it currently uh, communicates as its, its current um, uh, location or, or, or user interface state. For example, um, a very simple uh, turning knob could communicate uh, the current angle at which it is turned as a continuous value between you know, zero and 180 degrees. But it could also, for example, only communicate a few distinct positions. You know, when, you th when it's a knob that can only latch in at three different positions, like here, here, and here, and all the positions in between are not really positions that the device communicates, but it just latches into one of three different distinct states then this will be only three states and not a continuous um, sequence of them. The resolution function tells us how the input domain is mapped to the output domain that comes right after that. So um, the output domain, like the input domain, will be a physically described domain. But if we take the example of that station button, if it only has um, three distinct states that it can be in, like, I don't know, off level one and level two, for example, on a, on a hairdryer, um, then even though I'm turning the knob continuously, the input uh, con is, is continuous on, uh, in this uh, angle, right? in, this, in this interval of angles, the output is actually discrete, is discrete. It's only zero or one or two, if it's only like these three settings on a hairdryer, for example. And that is um, what the uh, resolution function then specifies. Um, okay, I need to move this back through. There we go. Uh, and the final thing, this is kind of a, eh, it's kind of a everything else, you know. Uh, Card and his colleagues realized that they couldn't describe everything that was important to say about an input device by just specifying these things. So additional work properties, like maybe how much space it took up on the desk or uh, something like this, or surprise, anything else that you wanted to specify, you could go, you know, would all get mashed in there. And it wasn't important for the, um, the key classification of the design space they created. Um, this is very abstract. So let's look at, an, at a real example here. Um, here's um, an old school radio. Um, now, <coughs> this may not be something you, you use every day these days, but it's a super helpful, uh, simple device to explain how the space works. First of all, we have uh, up here the radio at the top. And the radio has um, a, a volume button that can be turned continuously. It has a, a selection button to pick, you know, to turn it off or to choose AM or FM frequency um, bands. Uh, and then it has a station button, which you can turn, which moves the little needle at the top along this uh, display and selects the actual frequency you're listening to. Let's look at the volume button first. The volume button 
what kind of manipulation am I doing physically? Well, I am actually physically rotating my finger to turn the button. I'm physically rotating it uh, around the z-axis. This is the convention, you know, the thing that points away from the user is z-axis, the other two are the x and, and, and y-axis. So that's the input, rotation around the z-axis. What's the input range? Well, this particular volume control was specified to turn three quarters of a turn. So it goes from zero to 270 degrees. So my finger goes from zero to 270 degrees and it does that continuously. Yeah, I don't jump suddenly from one to the other. I can't, it's impossible. I can only move continuously through these movements, through these degrees. Um, the output, however, of the volume button is also continuous because it doesn't have any latches or, or, or stops that it latches into. It continuously uh, communicates my current uh, turned uh, angle to uh, the radio electronics because it's just a potentiometer that you just turn and it communicates that as a continuous position of a little, um, you know, of a little uh, contact on a, on a, on a, on a resistive uh, slider. Therefore, the resolution function is super simple. It's just the identity function. It just maps essentially my input to the output. The, the volume knob does not do anything with my input, uh, like you know, discretize it, for example. Uh, the additional work properties, like with all of the examples, as you can see here, is empty, so um, nil in good computer science terms. Now, that is what the physical volume button does. However, um, once the volume button has communicated its physical output, in this case, um, which is this position, the electronics in the radio translate this, um, in, in, and this is why it's called the application of that input device, um, to uh, a volume between zero and some constant times 270 decibels. Right? And you could pick that constant so that something useful comes out of it. This is where you would, the application could also specify this, this range should be maybe logarithmic or linear or whatever you want. Um, but that is something that the knob doesn't do. The knob only communicates the turned angle one-to-one -one into the device. It doesn't do anything to the input in terms of changing it or discretizing it. This is different with the station button. It has an input of a physical rotation, you know, the one in the middle, uh, of zero to 90 degrees. So only quarter turn is possible on this thing, basically from, from you'd say like about 10 o'clock to about two o'clock roughly. Um, and this turning, is, the current state is just like with the volume button, is, is, a, is a rotational angle, R. Um, but the resolution function is not the identity because the station button actually latches in place in, in three positions, at off, AM, and FM. And because it does that, it means that it only creates three distinct outputs. If you connect you know, measurement uh, electronics to the output of the station button, it will have pins that only tell you whether it's currently in the off state or AM state or FM state, right? It's basically three connections that get made uh, one or the other. Um, so the whole continuous range of my input gets discretized into three positions. Again, there are no work properties. And these three positions at zero, 45, and 90 degrees get then translated later by the application, the electronics and the radio, to three different states of the radio, being off or being in AM mode or FM mode. And finally, the station button is a little more complex um, because the station button in this radio is designed in a way that you can turn it and you can continue to turn it for as long as you want. Not like the volume or the, uh, the selection button. These stop at, the, at, the, uh, at their minimum and maximum ranges, right? The user cannot turn them any further. The station button, you can continue to twiddle, even if you go off the, the scale at the top. But what happens, of course, is that the, sta the scale then stops at the maximum frequency and the radio plays the maximum frequency and you just continue to twiddle and the, the button kind of slide, keeps sliding in its rotation uh, and ignores your future input, but it's possible to turn it. This means, and this is important to understand because people keep getting confused with this later when, they, when we talk about this, um, uh, this design space. This means that the input is now no longer an absolute rotational 
uh, manipulation, but it is this relative rotational manipulation, right? Um, so I'm not turning this button only from zero to 270 degrees. If I would put a little dot on the, on the station marker, it wouldn't only go from one range to the other, uh, like move within this particular range. It would actually keep going round and round and round if I, if I keep twiddling it. So I don't have a, uh, a sense of where the station button um, is at any point in time. I only know when it gets moved to the right or to the left and by how much. That's why the manipulation is a relative manipulation. By just looking at the station button, which I'll, without looking up at the top of the of the station display there, I don't know uh, what state the button is currently in. I couldn't tell. So the input is now no longer just a limited interval of numbers, um, a continuous interval, but it's actually uh, a real number. It's it's it could be anything, you know, because you can tweak it, you know, keep turning this thing. It could be, you know, zero degrees, two hundred seventy degrees, three hundred fifty degrees, three hundred seventy degrees. 400, 500, 600, 700 degrees, 831.7 degrees, I don't know. I keep, can keep going in, in both directions. The state, again, of this button itself is still um, a current position that it is at. And it but itself, the button also does not change that mapping. Physically, the, uh, the station button communicates uh, this position out to the... Um, to the application. But now something interesting happens. So we now have a real number essentially coming out of this button because it could be turned to any number of, of turns and any, any number of, of angles. Uh, and at each turn would be like 360 degree, uh, uh, 360 more degrees basically in both directions, positive and negative. But now something interesting happens. This turning gets in, in a case of these old school radios mechanically translated up to um, the display needle that moves across the top of the of the radio and this display needle actually um, Does something to it. It's not just a display. It also changes the output because while you move the needle across the display um, It reflects one-on-one -on -one what the station button is telling it to do, but when it hits in the minimum or maximum on the um, on the frequency scale it stops and even though the user keeps turning the knob, the scale doesn't move any further. So the scale itself is actually creating only output, if you want to consider it that, um, between the minimum and the maximum position on that, uh, on that scale that you can see on the radio. This is why the scale is also a step in the input device chain that we have here. The station communicates an endless twiddling to the, uh, the slider. The slider turns that into an x-axis linear movement between a minimum and maximum value, which you know, uh, is then further mapped to a frequency, but we don't care about that just yet. It's just a minimum maximum value. Let's call it 0 and 5. It doesn't matter. Um, and this position x, which you can see on the right-hand side of our, our graph here, uh, of our diagram here, is then basically the current state of the input needle. You know, and this, the station needle is only between zero and five and it, as it's moving continuously, but it's not moving outside that interval. So in that way, it's actually kind of similar to now uh, what we get with the, uh, the volume button, for example. But it's moving linearly, not rotary, and not a rotary movement. And what the station button then, uh, sorry, what the station needle then does is it outputs that as a function you know, between zero, uh, f of zero, it should be there, the, the, the graph is wrong there, it should be f of zero and f of five. Um, and this function then tells us in the application what kind of frequency the radio should be playing back. So by stopping at the edge of the screen and, and no longer um, interpreting the station's uh, buttons ro rotating, uh, twiddling, um, the needle actually is part of that input chain that modifies the input signal. Okay, so this showed you uh, an example of a rotary input and of linear input. It also showed you examples of absolute and relative movement uh, in these things and examples of different um, resolution functions that could be applied. Now, uh, let's take a look at how we compose these things. What we can see here is basically this radio as a whole 
if you want to consider the whole radio and input device, um, is using the volume button, the selection button, the station button, and this input needle, and they all kind of work together. We've already used a double uh, uh, edged or a, a double line uh, arrow here to indicate when data gets passed on from one device to the next stage. In the case of the station button, we have a chain from the station button through the um, uh, frequency scale uh, into, the, into the radio electronics with, with two steps. But there are other ways to compose things. For example, we've just put all these buttons onto one uh, control panel, onto the front of the radio. Uh, that's also a way of composing, um, which we'll also talk about. So we've got different composition operators, daisy chaining or uh, putting things next to each other on a box. Um, and we'll see another one in just a minute. So these composition uh, operators um, me tell you how you compo compose very fundamental movement operators into a input device. We will use the example of a classical mouse here. So this is a mouse that still has that fluff collecting rubber rolling ball at its bottom. Maybe when you're really young, you may have still seen one of those. I don't know. Um, if you've never picked fluff out of the underside of a mouse, then uh, you haven't lived the 80s, I think. Anyway, um, so the mouse, um, first of all, uh, these classic rollerball mouse, uh, mouse models are easier to explain this model with. So a classic rollerball mouse uh, would have a rubber ball in its, in its bottom, you know, kind of like what we saw in GIS-1 when you think back at uh, Doug Engelbart's mouse. Right? That's actually a very good example because it showed very clearly how, what it did. It didn't have a rubber ball. It had two metal wheels that would turn in different uh, orthogonal directions, one vertical, one horizontal. A rubber ball mouse would have just basically one rubber ball and two little sensors that would pick up that movement either in the vertical or in the horizontal direction as you move the mouse in X and Y. And these two little spinning uh, uh, sensors would then get picked up, as, I mean, the axis rotation would get picked up as movement in the X or Y direction, respectively. So a single sensor in there that only detects movement in the X direction is one input. And uh, another input is the input from the Y sensor. And these two are, in a mouse, uh, very closely linked. What I mean by this is that, from practical point of view, it's impossible to really uh, change one value without also changing the other. If you've ever tried to move a mouse perfectly horizontally on a screen, you know it's basically impossible. You always can you know, always change a little bit in vertical direction as well. So these two sensors are linked very closely together to create something useful together, to create an input, in this case, of relative movement in X and Y direction at the same time, in the X, Y plane. And this is why uh, we consider these two sensors to be merged. And the merge is the first composition operator that CARD identified. The result of that is, mathematically speaking, a Cartesian product, because we're essentially taking the um, relative mouse movement as an XY displacement from its previous position. Um, and it shows you immediately that you, know, you never just consider the, the X movement um, as being controllable individually. You'll know that the Y movement will also always happen. Another example, uh, maybe um, a little more recent, is um, if you look at um, simple remotes that often have an, an up and down button. Um, I know that, you know, for example, the, the Apple remote does that, but a lot of simple remotes do that too. And you've got an up and down button on it uh, that is actually a little um, tilt switch. You know, they can either tilt one way or the other. You cannot press both down at the same time. And because of that, these two uh, individual push buttons are linked through the, uh, through the tilt in the middle. Uh, it's like a teeter-totter, it can only go one way or the other. And since you can't push both down at the same time, you basically have created a new input device that merges the um, up and the down uh, volume button into a single device that can either be not touched at all, so no, none of the two buttons is pressed, or the up button can be pressed, but then the down button cannot be pressed or the down button is pressed, but then the up button cannot be pressed. The fourth combination of both being pressed is impossible due to the mechanics, how it's designed. So that would be another example of merging two buttons together into a single input device that is more powerful. 
That's the merge operator. Um, next up, we have uh, the layout operator. And this is the one we already saw on the radio where we just place things on the same box. Or if you take, for example, the three push buttons here in this example of an early mouse design uh, that had three buttons, you would take three buttons and put them on the top of the mouse. This example is taken straight from cards paper. So it's using a mouse that was um, you know, favorable uh, and, and popular back then. These three buttons have nothing to do with the rolling sensor. They can be um, activated independently uh, and they serve a different function. They're not merged together in the sense that we always want to interpret the whole result of mouse uh, movement and push buttons at the same time together. We can, but we don't have to. So this is why we call this the layout operator. A layout just means different input uh, primitives are spatially co-located. Um, the third one, the third composition operator, we already know. This is the connection operator. This is the daisy chain, where we take an input primitive or a composition of input primitives and pass on the result to um, a new stage of either another mechanical, electrical input device or to uh, computer software. The example we're seeing here is if you take the input from the mouse as a physical input device, which can only tell you, oops, I got moved to the right, I got moved to the left, I got moved up, I got moved down, or button one or two or three got pressed or released, right? That's all it can tell you. This then by daisy chaining gets passed on to uh, the monitor uh, and the operating system and the Windows system to create a mouse pointer at some position on the screen. And um, this is a good example because similar to the station uh, dial on the, on the radio we just saw, the mouse button, act, uh, sorry, the mouse cursor actually turns this relative input of the mouse into an absolute input because now you have a mouse pointer on the screen that cannot leave the boundaries of the screen. So no matter how much I roll my mouse to the right, uh, when the mouse pointer hits the right edge of the screen, it stops there, very much like the, the radio um, scale on, on the radio, the frequency scale. So what we've then created is basically a combination of a physical input device and what you could call a virtual input device like the mouse pointer. People always get confused about whether the mouse is a relative or absolute input device. And it's important to understand that the mouse itself has no idea where it is. If you put down a mouse on your table, um, you, know, you could put down your mouse over here. Uh, you could then uh, move it a bit and the mouse pointer would move to the right. You could pick up your mouse and people often do that if they don't have enough space on their desk or are trying to use the mouse on their knee or something like this. I've done that. Uh, and you put it back and, and you do more of that, right? We can do this kind of clutching motion and all the computer would be able to tell is that the mouse keeps getting moved to the right. It just sends us the relative movement. It cannot tell that actually in, in total coordinates, absolute coordinates, the mouse actually is keeping revisiting the same positions over and over. It doesn't know. So the mouse is a relative input device because it can only tell uh, that its position gets changed relative to where it was just the moment before while it is on the table and has a way to sense that. The buttons on the other hand on the mouse are absolute because the buttons, when they, whether they are pressed or not, is something you can always tell. The button in itself represents a state that you just need to look at it physically and you know whether it's pressed or not. There is not, nothing relative about it. It has two absolute states, pressed or not pressed. Okay, so here is then the design space that uh, um, Card and his colleagues uh, created. Um, and I should say that this is just a small excerpt from the actual design space. Because remember, we said that a real um, input device is this tuple out of six different things. So a design space that includes all input devices would actually, as, as points, would actually have all these six different tuples, uh, uh, parts of the tuple in there, all these six dimensions. Here, we are only looking at the manipulation operator. What style is the manipulation operator, M? And we are only looking at this tiny little part of the design space. So in this design space, the mouse, for example, is not a single point. 
like it would be in the in cars big design space but the mouse is actually a combination of primitive movement operators linked in certain ways using the composition um, uh, actions that we've seen the composition operators so let's look at what this means and and this keeps coming back so pay attention uh, actually you'll need this in just a minute in your in-class exercise too um, the first thing we can see is that the design space has several rows. Let's look at that first. It has one row, the first row, that is called P for absolute position. This is where all the things fall that, trans that communicate a physical absolute position. The three buttons on the mouse, we just said they are absolute position devices, are in there. There are the little three um, inside that red uh, triangle there. The, um, the next one, is delta position, so relative position, um, position displacement, and there is uh, the X and Y sensor from the mouse is in that area. And then we have a role called F for force, and that is absolute force being issued. This could be a, a force uh, touch screen, for example, on a modern smartphone like you know your, your iPhone. Um, but you know even back then in the in the 80s when this was published or 90s when this was published, there already existed um, force. Uh, input devices, at least in research labs. And the last one is the most exotic one. This is really weird, sort of the, the, the underworld of input devices. These are devices that would not detect absolute force level at any time, but that would detect only a change in force. But as you can see, uh, when Card and his colleagues came up with the design space, there was no input device that fell into that uh, area. That's the rows. Now to the columns. The columns are split up into linear and rotary, which means on the left-hand side, you have all the devices that where the user moves them around in a linear fashion. So the mouse, for example, gets moved in a linear fashion. The buttons on the mouse included. Um, rotary devices would be things like, you know, the radio is actually up here. If you see at the top right, we've got this little dotted area and the volume knob and the selection knob um, are in the rotary um, columns. And even the station knob is in there, although it is sort of a connection of two things, as we saw. Um, the, the, uh, the columns are further divided into X, Y, and Z, simply telling you around which, ang uh, area, around which axis the rotation happens or along which axis the movement happens. So for example, the mouse has the X and Y sensors up in the uh, linear X and Y um, movement columns. And then finally, play very pay very close attention to the very last row in this, uh, in this uh, space, which shows something from 1, 10, 100, and infinity. So this is a logarithmic scale that is telling you the resolution of that device. For example, a button has an extremely low resolution. It can only communicate two different states, on or off, like the push button, you know, pressed or not pressed. Whereas uh, a mouse sensor has a lot of resolution. It can communicate a relative movement very precisely with essentially infinite numbers of, of solution, especially if it's a physical you know, pickup sensor that then gets translated later and gets digitized only later in the computer software. That's your input device. Uh, space. So the design space of input devices. Now there's tons of stuff in here, uh, which we'll take a short look at, um, but I want to explain what, what the gr um, groups of stuff in here are. The things that are um, marked with a triangle are devices that somebody else called uh, Foley, um, who is also a famous HCI researcher and computer graphics re researcher, um, had James Foley had placed these things into an earlier version of a design space that he had published. Um, similarly, Bill Buxton, another uh, luminary of HCI research, um, has had also published a design space of some sort and had placed devices into his space. Um, and what uh, you know, Stu Cart and his friends were doing here, they were basically trying to show that their design space was better than the other design spaces because they were able to place all the devices that Foley and Buxton were placing, and more. 
you can see, so some were replaced only by Foley, others were uh, available only in Buxton's, uh, only Buxton was able to model in his design space. Some were modeled by both Foley and Buxton and uh, they've got all these in here and they've got more that only uh, Stu Carr and his colleagues were able to model or, or place into their design space. So we're trying to show that their design space was sort of the most encompassing one, the most universal one. Um, now let's briefly revisit the two examples. Uh, the radio is modeled near the top right. Um, first of all, we've got the volume button. What is it? Well, it's, it's a rotation around the z-axis. So it goes into the last column. It is a, um, an absolute position. It's not a relative device. So that's why it's in the top row. Um, and it is um, a um, near continuous resolution, right? The volume knob has no uh, discretization or latches or, or rasterizing. So it communicates a continuous position. That's why it is near the right side of that column. I should say, by the way, um, that the right side here, um, where it says R and DR and T and DT, is basically just mirroring the left uh, column, but for rotary um, words. So absolute position on the left uh, corresponds to absolute rotation on the right. Delta position, DP on the left, cor uh, corresponds to delta rotation or DR on the right. Um, F for force on the left, communicate. Uh, um, relates to T for torque, which is rotationary force, um, rotational force, um, and DF uh, for delta force relates to delta torque, so relative rotational force. That's why these um, letters are in the right-hand side. All right, so now uh, we can take a look at the selection knob. Uh, it's also placed in the same uh, column here. Um, so it's also absolute rotation around the z-axis, but it has way fewer uh, um, um, stops. So it only has three different states. So that's why it's near the left-hand side of that column. And the two of them are linked, but with this dotted line around them, which is creating a whole little blob here uh, because they're placed on the same front panel. Now comes the station knob which we actually found is also rotational, but it's relative. That's why it's in DR here at the, at the bottom in the second uh, row at the right hand side. It's a continuous um, turning uh, potentiometer. Um, and the station function is not created by itself because it by itself just gives you near infinite resolution, relative rotation around the z-axis, but it's, it's then daisy chained or um, connected to uh, something at the top left, which is the actual linear station scale. And that scale actually moves linearly from left to right in the X axis. And it also has very high resolution. There's no digital, um, you know, discretization happening there. Um, but it is absolute. So it has a, a beginning and an end. And that's why it's at the top there. And the whole radio is then made up by this these three things, the station, the selection, and the volume, and the station itself is made up by these two primitives, the continuous potentiometer and the linked uh, horizontal needle moving back and forth. We've also highlighted the mouse in this design, which is something you're way familiar with and we've just looked at. And as you can see, it has uh, an X and Y sensor. Both are relative position, as we just said, the mouse doesn't know its absolute position by itself. And <coughs> They are linked with a connected line, which means merge operator. Um, and they are also connected with a dotted line, which means composition. So it's, uh, in the same box, we have the three buttons, which are moving as absolute around the z-axis, away from the user, pushing down and perpendicular to the x-y movement of the mouse. The mouse moves in x and y, and the user pushes down uh, along the x-axis. Um, and all of those, basically, these three together make up the, the mouse. And the, the buttons are way on the left-hand side because they only each of these buttons only has a resolution of one bit, essentially, so only two different states, whereas the sensors uh, moving in X and Y have near infinite resolution. It has a little three in there, which is just a shorthand that the authors used to say, I would really have to draw three little um, uh, markers there and connect them 
uh, with a dotted line, but I'm just saying there's three of them uh, by putting the number in there. There are lots other, of other uh, devices placed in here, uh, light pens, tablets, uh, a standard keyboard, for example, near the top. Um, take a look at the paper and, and find these devices in there and think about why they are placed in that space. Um, and I know this is sort of uh, abstract, and although we've talked through a couple examples, I want you guys to turn on your own brain and try a little uh, in-class exercise with me. Um, and the in-class exercise is this. <clears throat> Imagine the following. You have um, a car simulation controller. Um, so this is the Ferrari racing controller here. Um, and it features a steering wheel, which obviously um, you can turn. It has eight buttons in total mounted on the steering wheel. We've marked them in the, in the graphic. It also has a rotary switch with five states, which is um, there near the, uh, the right-hand side of the, the steering wheel. Um, and it has two pedals. The pedals you place um, you know, at your feet and use them. Um, and for, for this uh, exercise, you should assume um, that the pedals only have uh, one full rotation, okay? So um, this is what you're doing. Uh, and what I would like you to do now is take three minutes or five minutes maybe and uh, draw your own little uh, design space, uh, sketch this space. Uh, I'm gonna show you this in, in detail here. So this gives you the same information. You still can see the uh, controllers and what they do, but you also have the design space sketched again here for your convenience. Um, and I would like you to try to place this controller as a whole into the design space. Give this a shot, use a piece of paper, scrap, um, draw the design space, mark it, mark the columns and rows, um, and then try to place this controller in there. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, post them in the chat or speak up and uh, we can try to address them. There is a question um, from Yune uh, Jang that I wanted to address uh, about the confusion, confusion with the different axes. Um, the, how you place your coordinate system is really uh, a question of convention. You can, you can place it um, any way you want, but what uh, people usually do when they model these things is to say, um, when, I'm, uh, you know, when I'm holding a device like this, uh, I'm thinking of my finger going towards the device, this being the, the Z axis. And if my finger moves side to side, uh, that's the, the X axis. And if my finger moves up and down like this, it's the Y axis. So I'm usually imagining the X, Y axis as a plane in front of me. If I'm operating something here, then the X, Y axis would be here. If I'm operating something uh, while, I'm, while I'm standing or, 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 or facing downwards, then the uh, X, Y axis would be there. And the z-axis is always pointing away from my nose, so to say, towards the device. That's usually the, the convention. And if you rotate around an axis, then if you rotate a knob that's in front of you, uh, then you would be rotating that like this, because the z-axis is going from here to there, and I'm rotating around that axis. If I were to rotate something around um, the, uh, I have to think myself now, around the x-axis, for example, which is going like this, then that would mean that I would rotate it like that. And the rotating on the y axis would be rotating like this. Does that, that help understand the, uh, the concept? OK. Oh, good question here. Um, what why we are pointing out that the steering wheel has only one rotation um it, we'll go through the solution first and then maybe we can address that uh when we talk about these options uh what happens if there was more than that 
Ah, uh, yeah. And Marvin is asking the trickiest question that uh, comes up with this example, uh, which is what about those pedals? Are we pushing or are we rotating? Um, I usually tend to, both, both can be argued for. Um, I usually tend to think that in the end, it's most important to understand what the user is doing. And for the user, this may feel like a push action. For example, if you have a, a rocker switch that goes like this, the user is still pushing down to operate the rocker switch, even though the rocker switch, you know, in principle is rotating. So uh, I think the user action is more uh, important to understand what the device uh, enables. All righty. Um, I think our five minutes are up. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, at the solution here. Um, how do we place this? So we've got our space here. And first of all, uh, one thing, and like we said, we need to establish what, what are we considering to be our coordinate system. We are considering our coordinate system to be the one that uh, points away from my face towards the device, in this case, towards the steering wheel at first. And we got eight buttons and we push those buttons along that axis. So we're pushing them along the Z axis and buttons, as we said, move linearly in one axis because I pushed them down um, and they have absolute placement because they know whether they are pushed or not pushed. There's nothing relative about them. They have two defined positions that they can, you can look at a button, examine it physically and you know exactly what state it is in. So this is where the eight buttons go, easy enough. Now, uh, next up, we've got the, um, the pedals. Um, and as I said, you can argue both ways. You could argue them from a user's point of view um, that they are really being more like pushed down uh, along the z-axis, similar to the buttons. Or you could argue that they rotate around the x-axis because they, they tilt as the user pushes them down. In our example here, we've marked them as rotary x. Um, but like I said, you could just as easily uh, consider them to be more of these uh, z-axis push buttons. Um, the difference, of course, whether you consider them rotational or, or linear, is that especially um, the pedals have an infinite number of states, right? This is an, a continuous controller. Uh, you are moving the pedal, in this case, around an angle um, down that is not digitized in any way, that is not rasterized in any way. So we have infinite resolution on these things, although it is only within a certain interval, only between, let's say, you know, zero and 90 degrees or something like this, or zero and 45 degrees. Um, but in between any number is possible. So infinite uh, resolution on here, <coughs> uh, which is different than uh, boundless, right? Uh, uh, something that can have all of R as, as its input. Uh, next up, we've got the rotary switch. Now the rotary switch um, gets turned around basically like the, the steering wheel itself, but just in small, it gets turned around the X axis facing away from me. So uh, that's why it would go over here. Um, it's a single switch and it has five states instead of um, just, um, you know, uh, two states um, like buttons do. Um, but that's still a very low number of states that the switch gives you. So the user, just like with the station button on the radio, creates a continuous input, but the input gets mapped to only five of these different states. And then we have uh, the steering wheel itself, um, which rotates around the same axis, um, the Z axis, and it is also an absolute device because we said that it would stop at some point, we, this, we said it has only one rotation. Now, to come back to your question, if I had said it has 1.5 rotations or two or three rotations before it hits a, hits a stop, it would still fall into that same box. You would just specify the uh, interval, the um, input domain, uh, co you know, correspondingly, you would say it goes from zero to, or from minus uh, 720 degrees to plus 720 degrees if you wanted to cover four full rotations, for example. Um, it still is an absolute input device. If the steering wheel, for some reason, 
you know, like you have them sometimes on, um, uh, on these, you know, um, uh, box cars in, in, uh, um, on the, the Aachen bend, when you can keep turning your wheel as often as you want, then it will become a relative um, input device. Okay, so that's the steering wheel. And all of these um, are then combined, and this is easily forgotten, um, with dotted lines. Um, you can you know, draw the dotted um, you know, amoeba around it, or you can connect them with dotted lines because they're all placed together. Uh, you could argue that the pedals are actually physically separate from the steering wheel, so you could consider them two separate controllers. Um, but you know, since they're being used for one application um, uh, uh, purpose here, we consider them to be one input device. And they are spatially co-located. Um, why don't we consider, uh, Ferris is asking, why don't we consider the pedals as force input devices? Great question. Um, now, uh, these input pedals, when you push them down and you let go, they will come back because they're spring-loaded, right? So you might say, hmm, isn't that actually a force input? Well, um, it's not because you are still changing the device's position. You're actually moving it in space. A pure force input device would be something that doesn't move notably in space, that only detects your force using a sensor. Um, there is another one. Uh, da, 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 da. Trying to catch up here. Pedals get somewhat pushed in Z and Y direction or not. Well, yeah, so um, yeah, the pedals would, if you consider them as, as a linear push, it would be sort of angled. Um, this is not something that the, the uh, design space captures well. Um, because you can't put them at the boundary of two of these things because the meaning to place something uh, to the left or the right of a box means how much the resolution it has. So you'd have to fall for like the, the major uh, direction that these things kind of align with. Right, and uh, as Sebastian is pointing out, um, you, you would then probably just um, reorient your coordinate system for the... Um, uh, for the pedals uh, appropriately. All right. Um, Ferris, does that answer your question? You happy with that? Okay, so um, we'll be moving on. Uh, there is an interesting question here, which is, are we capturing all the devices that we can with this? I would like to uh, see your hands um, if you have an idea, whew, if you have an idea whether the space is complete or not. Yeah, Johannes, go ahead. Unmute yourself, yeah. Uh... Well, this space wouldn't be complete since it's only showing mechanical sort of actions, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we have, do you have an example for something that wouldn't be captured? Uh, earlier on, you mentioned uh, auditory and mm -hmm. perhaps uh, exactly. visual. Yeah. So, so anything that doesn't involve uh, some sort of physical manipulation in space isn't captured. So a voice interface, for example, you know, Alexa, um, there might be some buttons on Alexa, I don't know, but uh, for sure um, the, the main interaction via voice is not captured with this. And that's not the point of it, right? Um, it's really just uh, talking about mechanical input devices. Good. So um, now what can you do with this? First of all, it's a nice, you know, it's a nice exercise in thinking this through what this, what this uh, space actually does. <coughs> and what a device does that play, falls into a particular space here. But uh, we can do more with this. We can, for example, evaluate, um, uh, and we can see sort of in this space, uh, when we look at the larger definition of input and output domains, how expressive um, our devices are. What do I mean by this? Expressiveness um, describes how precisely a meaning is conveyed. And there are two ways in which this can break down. Um, whenever the 
um, size of the input domain of the different values in the input domain differs from the size of different values in the output domain, the cardinal values, if you like, if those are different, then expressiveness suffers. And this is subtle, but I want you guys to, to see if you, can, uh, if you can follow me with this. Um, the first thing that could happen is your input resolution is lower than the output resolution. This means uh, there are fewer distinct input values than output values. Which then means that uh, we have some output values that we actually cannot specify. Which would kind of suck, right? We don't want that. Um, I have an example for you where you can see that happening and, and you can immediately tell why it's a problem. Anybody ever try to operate your mouse using uh, your cursor keys, using your keyboard arrow keys? You know, if you try that, um, then what you see happening is that your mouse will jump in little increments, right? Because pressing your cursor key to move your mouse one pixel at a time is very tedious. So it typically jumps by like, I don't know, 64 pixels at a time or something like this. Uh, and there are ways then to slow down and reach uh, smaller ways. But if you have a cursor key that advances your mouse, uh, you know, 64 pixels at a time, there will be small eye targets on the screen that you cannot reach because you jump over them. So your input is these, um, is this, is only these um, cursor positions that you can reach, but your output where you would like to get is actually bigger. You want it to cover the whole continuous space on the screen uh, and you cannot, right? Because your input device, uh, your input um, domain is too small in terms of its cardinality. So that's not good. But what about the other direction? The other direction is actually probably easier to understand um, because the, um, when the out input domain is larger than the output domain, um, this means that some input values need to be mapped to uh, basically cannot be mapped to defined output values. Very simple example is the radio station knob. Remember the AM FM station knob, right? It had three positions that made sense, off, AM or FM. But I'm turning this knob uh, continuously from, you know, zero, uh, to 90 degrees, uh, through the 45 degrees, through 90 degrees. Um, what happens when I'm halfway in between AM and FM? This is something that uh, you as a device designer then need to decide, right? Um, it's clear when the station knob is in its leftmost position, um, I close the switch that turns the radio, tells, turns the radio off, um, or I cut the power or something. When it's at the AM station, I turn on AM. When it's at the FM station, I turn on FM. But, but what happens when I'm halfway in between? Do I stick with AM until I reach the FM one? Do I turn the radio off if the user turns the button halfway and leaves it there, if that's even possible? Do I design it so that there's no way to stop there, that it will always latch into one of the two positions? Probably a good idea. Um, but you know, we've all maybe encountered a device where you know, you've left, the, the button wasn't quite latched into the position where it should be, and then you are in this like no man's land. And this is what you get when your input domain is larger in its cardinality than the output domain. You can actually, the user can specify if you want illegal values. And that's something you need to be aware of in your input device design and in how you process the data coming from that device. Because it may be in an illegal state and not able to communicate that to you. All right, so that's the, that's the story about input and output uh, express, uh, domain uh, cardinality and, and expressiveness. You know, a, a perfect uh, input device, of course, has input and output mapped to each other so that you, know, you, you neither can specify legal values, but you also don't lose the op op opportunity to specify some values that should be possible. Here's another way um, to look at this. So uh, the effectiveness basically uh, communicates how well your intention can be uh, communicated. Um, and effectiveness of an input device is a slightly different story. Uh, you could measure it using performance measurements, for example, how fast can people um, select targets with a particular technique, 
That's a very common thing to do. Um, or you could also look at pragmatic things. Um, um, an example could be the device footprint. So what I'm showing you here is a picture from the paper that just as an example shows how you could augment the uh, design space notation. You don't have to, but you can. It's a starting point for this. You could augment the notation to include the footprint of each device. And what the authors did here is they show you by the size of the circle how much space this device takes up on your desk. And they don't do this just for one uh, example for each device, but they do it for a small monitor and for a large monitor. It's kind of cute, you know, this paper was written in the 90s, so they consider a small monitor to be 12 inch and a large one to be 19 inch, uh, which is really funny because right now I'm looking at a 38 inch monitor here. Uh, but, you know, you, you get the idea. Um, and so what you can see, for example, is that if you use a mouse and you move to a larger monitor, then your space that you need, basically the size of your mouse pad that you need, gets a little bigger, but not by much because mice usually use um, input acceleration so that a faster movement gets you to um, the corners of your screen more quickly when you have a larger screen. So this is okay, right? It, gets, it takes up a reasonable amount of space, uh, size of uh, you know, roughly an A5 sheet maybe of paper, and it gets bigger as the, your monitor gets bigger to still be able to use it comfortably uh, and being able to precisely point at things on the screen, but you know, not too bad. Um, a um, touch screen, on the other hand, um, takes up zero additional space. Now it takes up all the space of your display, of course, so it's big, but your display is there anyway. So if you just add touch capability to a screen, you haven't wasted any additional space in the user's work environment uh, and that could be a big advantage, right? That's why the touch panel on top of a screen has basically just mathematically small dots there. Um, similar, by the way, for the light pen, which is, you know, this input device that you may remember from uh, the early examples when we looked at um, um, the um, input uh, devices for early um, user interface um, sort of history, history breaking devices. So, um, the interesting thing is the tablet here. A tablet is a separate thing where you can just do pen input, you know, like a, a tablet that is not, does not have a screen and you use, your, you use a pen on it to, to control your cursor on the screen. That takes up a lot of space. You know, you need a tablet and that needs to be, become linearly bigger if you use a bigger screen, if you want to be able to work at the same resolution because it doesn't have, up, uh, it cannot speed up. The tablet is an absolute input device. Uh, every time I point at the top left corner, I'm pointing at the top left corner. It's not a relative device um, like the mouse. And that's the price you pay. And there are some other examples you can uh, look at in more detail. For example, the trackball that spins basically in place um, is, is a good example of something that is basically very uh, space efficient. Okay, so this was just to il illustrate that you can use this design space to find out more about device and to reason about device designs. You could, for example, come up with your own marking way to uh, point out the device bandwidth that the device has, like how much uh, time takes it to reach a target or how precise can it be? How high is the cognitive load to operate? How, may, how big is the error rate that people make? Uh, what's the learning time? What's the time to grasp it? You know, some devices you can use and they're very effective like a virtual reality glove but it takes a lot of time to put them on and, and, and remove them. Um, so, so this is basically uh, showing you that the design space of input devices is a useful tool to reason about input devices. Okay, um, in the last uh, roughly 10 minutes we have, we will give you guys just a sneak peek of where we will be going uh, next in this class, uh, starting next week. Um, and this is the Windows system architecture. Windows systems are the thing that lies on top of the operating system and that manage everything that has to do with the user's graphical input and output and management of Windows. So they are significantly complex software architectures. Um, input means, you know, gather the input that occur in the hardware on your mouse, your keyboard, your other input devices on your touch screen and distribute it to the right application. Output handling means um, 
we need to visualize what an application wants to draw on in the right window of that application, not the wrong one, at the right position on the screen. Um, and window management means that we need to provide the user controls uh, to move windows around, especially on a desktop. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, it's more about like, you know, switching between different applications in full screen mode. Um, but also defining a menu bar, for example, and its look, allowing the rearranging of these. In general, redefining all these different little, you know, defining all these little user interface controls that we have. We've got buttons, we've got menus, we've got scroll, scroll bars. Um, we have windows that we show content in. All of these things we don't want to invent from scratch every time we write a graphical app. All of these things are part of what a Windows system does. Um, uh, Sebastian, there's a question there in the show notes, maybe you, in the chat where you can uh, address that while I continue on. First of all, I want to talk about a couple of requirements that you have when you look at a window system. And the reason for listing this is that uh, these are things you should have on your checklist to verify um, whether this is important for a particular project that you're doing and whether the system that you're using uh, supports it appropriately or whether you need to switch maybe to a different one. Ideally, a window system um, you know, can be independent of the hardware and the operating system so that you can swap that out underneath. Um, but most commercial Windows systems today are actually deeply ingrained with the underlying operating system and hardware. You get Mac OS and it only runs on a Mac. You get Windows, but it only runs on a Windows PC. Uh, so there's not that much of this disconnection in commercial tools these days. More importantly, maybe uh, for the user is that you have no noticeable delays for the basic operations, like moving a window or redrawing a cursor. You may remember from DIS1, and if you didn't attend DIS1, take a look at this, that we had some, um, some deadlines. Like we figured out that there's 100 milliseconds that you have time to react to a discrete input from the user. Like the user pressing a button, you have 100 milliseconds maximum. You should be faster, but you have up to 100 milliseconds maximum to paint that button black so that the user sees that the action was received. Because 100 milliseconds is that window, remember Bloch's law and so on, uh, in which people will te still tend to perceive things as happening at the same instant. Now, here's the problem. When we are talking about a graphical user interface, this 100 millisecond latency is way too long. Because if I am drawing a curve, if I'm drawing um, a moving mouse pointer that moves across the screen, and the user starts moving that mouse pointer, and you get delays of like 50 or 80 milliseconds in there, that starts to feel terrible. And it becomes completely unacceptable when you're on uh, a tablet. You know, when you're using a tablet and you can see the point where you're drawing, like in the drawing applications. Drawing applications on tablets are the worst for latency. But when you draw on an application and there's even the slightest delay, even just a few milliseconds, you immediately see that the drawing is actually lagging behind your pen. And that sucks and it's super confusing. So we have to be really good in, in latency, um, especially when we're looking at things where the user's physical input, like with a pencil, is where the virtual input is happening as well. That's why a lot of interfaces actually avoid that. If you look closely at your iPhone or Android, you will see that most times when you're touching stuff, you are actually not, the, the system is not indicating your touch position because if it was indicating a precise touch position, you would start noticing the latency. Anyway, Windows systems should be customizable. So you should be able as an end user uh, to customize the look and feel for your preferences. Um, and that's something that the system needs to take into account. Um, input and output, of course, need to happen, be, ha be able to happen in, in parallel. Um, not just in the sense that I have multiple uh, applications running, but also that I want to be able to work with an uh, application type text and at the same time display messages in it and so on. We want to see support for audio, for uh, visuals, for, for media, uh, playback and so on. And of course, we don't want to stop at keyboard and mouse. Um, you know, the Java original um, uh, toolkit actually hard coded mouse and keyboard as input devices like this was the end of everything that would ever happen. Um, and they quickly fixed that. So those were some, some hard requirements, but we can think about a larger list of evaluation criteria 
um, that tell you what you could look at and consider whether it's the right thing for your, for your use of a Windows system or when you're designing your own Windows system, whether this is an important thing to follow up on. Which platforms are you supporting? Availability on different platforms. Um, or which platforms is the Windows system supporting? Um, how productive is it to write apps? This is a huge one. The original Mac OS um, um, Windows system was great for the end user, but it was really tough to write code for. Most of the early Windows systems were really tough to write applications for because we hadn't grappled the idea of how to support this well in our developer tools. So that's a big one um, because developer time is expensive. You guys, once you go out in industry, you're gonna be super expensive per hour. So uh, when somebody starts a project and hires a developer, they want that developer to be fast and productive. The parallelism inside the system, of course, most modern operating systems have uh, high degrees of parallelism built in. They can kick the processor off. Uh, they can kick a process off the processor, uh, but you should also be able to run different applications side by side. And you can see that this goes back and forth. You know, with the advent of the iPhone and iPad and tablets and, and smartphones on Android, we first saw a fallback to a single screen applications, right? We had only one application in the foreground that we'd be using. Then tablets became bigger, and at some point, for example, uh, Android and iOS start reintroducing multi-screen views where you could see multiple screens side by side. Um, so we're going back and forth on this um, as we move through technology. Of course, these systems have a certain um, demand on the resources um, that they need for performance, and that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, but more importantly, maybe for our purposes is are you looking at a, a Windows system that uses still a raster uh, model so that basically specifies everything in pixels? Or are you looking at a model that uses resolution independent vector graphic uh, down deep into the core? Um, with uh, Display PostScript, we saw in the, in the 90s, the first Windows systems emerged that were actually uh, resolution independent, uh, which makes a huge difference if you're trying to address different screen resolutions, different sizes of monitors, but also create print output versus screen output. So raster um, is kind of uh, dead. The, can, can I extend the uh, window system at runtime? Um, can I actually upload code into the core of the window system running? Or can I change it to, for example, add multi-touch support to a window system? Usually this works with open source systems. Um, uh, these days, it's usually something that you can just change on the fly and the next app you launch will already pick up these new customizations. If you have resources like fonts that nobody ever wants to uh, write access to, uh, everybody just wants to read these uh, memory resources, then you should be able to share them. So not everybody needs to load their own copy of the same uh, font into memory. Some Windows systems uh, can be distributed over the network. Um, what I mean by this is that part of the Windows system is running on one computer, another part of the Windows system is running on another. Again, the X Windows system, we will see how that uh, provides sort of the gold standard in being distributable. Um, and it's something that gets harder in modern um, commercial systems. And we'll talk about why that is the case. The API, again, thinking about the application developers that need to write apps for that Windows system, the API should be structured in a way and comfortable to write with so that it is effective and efficient for you to write apps with that system. Um, and then what's really nice is if you can write your program so that it actually does this great job that we talked about already in DIS1 of dividing away the application logic um, from the interaction logic. So ideally your business logic of your code is on one side and your GUI code is, is another part. And you can split these nicely so that if you need to port, let's say, your, your business application from Windows to Mac OS, it should just mean exchanging the Windows system part because the business logic stays the same. Modern Windows systems on the desktop always support copy and paste and drag and drop. And this almost became a moot point for me to discuss until we saw the iPhone that didn't support copy and paste between applications and people just went crazy with it. Oops. My camera changed to a weird color. I'll just fix that real quick here. Okay, audio is back again. Thanks for the poll. Um, this creates a conflict and we're almost at the end of this. Uh, this is the last but one slide. Uh, we're, at, we're looking at a conflict. 
the Windows systems developer, if you're, you know, like an architect of a whole Windows system, you want this system to be elegant, right? We're computer scientists, we're engineers, we want this to be an elegant design, it should be extendable, it should be something uh, that I can add things to easily later on, it should have code that's clearly structured that people can contribute to, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The app developer honestly doesn't care. The app developer wants a system that provides lots of convenient libraries and frameworks um, so that it's very quick to get up and running and write a running app that uses the widgets, the, the user interface components that the window provides. And the user, again, doesn't care, sorry to say this, but they care neither about the app developer nor about the Windows systems developer's pain. They only want a system you know, that they can use comfortably, that works well for them, that they can customize to their own needs, um, and that just provides them uh, with a convenient experience where they can feel competent and uh, enjoy using it. And this is a conflict that every Windows system solves slightly differently. Um, we'll see in our examples of what these uh, different resolution points are. Which takes me to uh, our last slide for today. This is the Windows system architecture that we will be taking a look at uh, in the next two weeks. Um, which is the reference model. And we'll have a text for you to take a look at um, that explains this reference model. It's a model that you can slot most Windows systems into. You can see how each Windows system fulfills these different functions. Um, not all the Windows systems clearly structure themselves that way, of course, um, especially with more than commercial Windows systems, it's sometimes hard to find out how they structure themselves exactly because they don't tell you. Um, but we will use this still to see where these functions fall and how these Windows systems have resolved it. To put it simply, uh, from the hardware, we have a graphics event library that processes incoming events uh, that passes them to a base Windows system, which then takes these events and puts them into the right application. Um, then the window manager gives, you a, gives the user a way to move windows around on the screen, uh, to, micro, uh, to minimize them, to maximize them, to close and launch applications. And the user interface toolkit is then what an application uses to create its own buttons, menus, scroll bars, et cetera. And on the way out, the application wants to draw a circle, sends it to the UI toolkit's appropriate commands, and then that gets passed through the win uh, window manager, sometimes directly to the base window system, which finds out where exactly that window is on the actual physical screen, and then pipes into the graphics library that draws the actual thing that the application wanted. So in a nutshell, that's how this window system architecture will work. The more higher you, the higher you get into this layer, in this layer model, the more abstract and more, the more user-oriented uh, the concepts are that each layer works with. Not entirely unlike the ISO OSI uh, model, but um, different here uh, and gives you an idea of how modern Windows systems um, manage the complexity that's available. It's idealized, real systems are often fuzzier, um, but usually different levels are shielded from the ones below, uh, above so that you don't have to worry about them too much when you're working on a high level. It's the whole virtual um, machine concept at work, basically. The OS, by the way, is usually down here um, below the graphics and event library. Um, and depending on what you look at, in Windows, for example, it's all integrated. Um, usually it sits, it sits at this lower level below the graphics and event library. All right, uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, we will have um, a first lab session, um, and I will see you guys all online in uh, the next lecture uh, next week. Thanks for joining, and uh, have a good start into the semester. Bye. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.